We called rho a Borel non-negative function defined on a metric space x, an upper gradient of another function u defined on x into extended real numbers, if along every rectifiable curve gamma, the integral of the Borel function over gamma, which is well defined, is bigger than the difference of the u values at the two ends of the curve. Based on this, we called a function u, a measurable function u, in the space N1P with respect to this metric space and a new measure on it, usually Borel, if u itself is an LP integrable function and it has at least one upper gradient, which is also LP integrable. And on such functions, we can define a norm by infamizing over all LP integrable upper gradients of that function. Um, after introducing this class of functions, we saw a non-example where you have the function that is equal to one only on one line segment and then zero everywhere else. And despite being almost everywhere equal to zero, this function is not in the Newtonian space because it does not have an upper gradient, uh, which we proved um, in two videos. Today we want to talk about an example which will emphasize why um, this N1P that we have above has to be quotiented out by some equivalence to turn it into a Banach space. And the reason for that is that there exists U on X that is not zero. It's not the zero function. Belongs to N1P of X, but a norm of u, n1p norm of that, is equal to zero. So this then means that um, this class of functions, n1p is not a normed space. So we, of course, ultimately want to obtain a Banach space, but this is not even a normed space because norm of some non-zero elements uh, happens to be zero. But whenever we have this situation, this is an abstract thing, function analysis trick. It's nothing special to Newtonian class that uh, we quotient out uh, with this relation, with relation that u1 is equivalent. We identify such two functions um, if u1 minus u2 norm n1p is equal to zero in which case this example that we we will construct uh, will be identified with the zero function because its norm is zero um, but remember this convention that we will always use that we we, we don't really well we still to obtain a banach space we do this quotient thing but we still uh, keep thinking of functions, measurable functions, as everywhere defined at every single point. So we don't really identify functions. We still distinguish between two functions, even if they differ at only one point, um, which is a a good thing to do if we want to talk about very detailed properties of subular functions. Um, so after this, then then this is an exercise that proved that then um, this space becomes becomes normed space. Proving that it's a Banach space is much more involved. But where is my example and uh, what does it look like? 
So to construct the example, we take again uh, x equal to r2, simple, start always simple, especially when it comes with counterexamples. And as the measure, we take the Lebesgue L2 measure. So that is our metric measure space. So measurability and LP integrability will be with respect to this measure L2. My function, which is from R2 into R, is um, u of x equals 0 if x is other than 0, 0. And u of 0, 0 is equal to 1. So this is a function that is non-zero only at origin with value equal to 1. This is uh, clearly an almost everywhere zero function. We want to show that the goal is to show that u belongs to n1, uh, 1. I want to show m1, 2 actually. So m1, 2 of x d mu. And so two things. Number two, that it's norm, because to even write down this norm, we first need to prove that it is in N12 is zero. So why does this function have an upper gradient? We want to, okay, then improve. I'm having difficulty drawing straight lines. So we want to prove that along every path gamma, that u of gamma at two endpoints. So to do one, find row Borel such that we have this. So for every rectifiable curve, we have this quantity bounded by integral of rho over um, gamma. We see that if a curve starts and ends at points outside this origin, then this quantity is just zero, and we don't really need to look hard to find a candidate rho. So basically, rho equals zero almost works. Um, so it's only the problem also if gamma of a is equal to gamma of b and they both equal origin then uh, rho equals zero works so it's only the problem of so we must we start with basically just rho equals zero, but need to modify it so that this inequality star holds also when, uh, without loss of generality, gamma of a is other than zero, zero. We start away from zero, zero, and we end there gamma of b equals 0, 0. So we want to start with, with a row um, defined on R2, a Borel function, so that no matter what curve I take, that it starts away from 0 and ends there, the integral of rho along that curve um, becomes at least 1. Because remember, this is just u of gamma b minus u of gamma a. So if I make this bigger than 1, so um, look for Borel rho such that this holds uh, for every gamma ending at origin. So curves that have this property can, can look very different, can be wild, it can be a straight line. Um, 
it can hit the origin multiple times. So it's just any rectifiable curve. So, but, but how do we start with a candidate row that does this? The first observation is that even if you have extremely short curves, you still need to have integral bigger than one. So your row should really be large enough to give the integral bigger than one uh, very close to the origin. And this will force row to go to infinity near origin. And uh, the other observation that can help us is that how um, integral, that integral of rho gamma in general is bigger than m length of gamma if rho is bigger than m on all of gamma. So this is a basic inequality. So um, knowing the length of a curve can help us decide how much really we want to spend on rho. Remember that we cannot um, just take any row. We could take row infinity, of course, and have the upper gradient infinity, but we want row to end up uh, in L2. So remember, so let's maybe add it here. So we want this row to belong to L2 of R2. That's the point. We don't want to go extremely crazy. So we, uh, we want to blow up row near here, origin, but still we want to remain integrable. So all said and done, um, here is how we can construct a row. So you take these annuli, uh, let's say at um, positions 2 to negative j. So let's say this is 2 to negative j plus 1. And this is at the radius 2 to negative j. And then you keep going down like this. So if a curve, say, it starts outside this j one and ends there, uh, be, by just continuity argument, you can see that it hits this um, circle, and also at some point it hits this. It can go back and forth multiple times, but at least there are two points where it hits these circles, which then means that that part of this curve length of that part of gamma is at least, well, um, the thickness of this annulus, which is 2 to negative j. Let's call this aj to be using complex notation, that annulus, so 2 to negative j plus 1, bigger than 2 to um, negative j and then we define our row by the following um, formulas so it's zero if z is bigger strictly bigger than one let's say okay and it is equal to two to the power j divided by j if z belongs to this aj and what happened to this okay 2 to the power j divided by j and then it's zero uh, it's infinity as actually let's say if uh, z is just the origin okay um rho is borel which is easy to check and uh, also rho is in L2 of R2 uh, because, well, integral over R2 of rho squared dL2 is less than or equal to, okay, outside the unit circle, it's zero, so nothing happens there. And on, in annulus, uh, in annulus aj, the, this is the value of the function, so this goes to power 2. And then area of the annulus j, I want to be really um, generous and say, let's say it's not even annulus, it's a full disk 
with the outer radius, uh, which will be 2 to negative j plus 1, uh, to power 2, so this would be pi times that, right? So this is the area of the annulus, multiply the value of the function rho squared there, and then you sum them over j, of course, and this will be, let's say, less than 100 times summation of 1 over j squared, j from 1 to infinity, which is a finite value. So rho is in L2, rho is Borel. It remains to show that rho is an upper gradient. And uh, for this, we go back to this observation that a path that starts off origin and goes towards origin hits infinitely many of these annuals. So it may start very close to the origin, so it may hit, miss the initial largest circles like radius 2, radius 1 half, radius 1 fourth, and so on. But it definitely picks all the tail for the smaller ones. So if gamma is as above, again, the main feature is rectifiable. It starts off origin and then moves to the origin. Then there exists some, let's say n0, natural number, such that gamma hits all circles of radius or radii 2 to negative j for j bigger than or equal to n0. So it hits all these smaller circles. Out of these, we can extract uh, pieces of the curve, which are non-overlapping. We can even say that pieces of the curve that remain within the annulus. So you can look at the last time it hits the outer circle and and the first time it hits the inner circle so that you can actually extract pieces that do not leave the annulus between those um, intervals. But whatever happens is that when we try to integrate rho along this gamma, we can look at those pieces that happen. So let's say gamma j is the piece that lives inside the annulus aj rho ds and j now is from n0 to infinity uh, i'm not sure about the very first one whether we fix the index correctly so let's just be safe and put it here but then inside this annulus so remember gamma j um, lives completely in aj where the value of the function rho is 2 to plus j over j. And then length of gamma j is at least the thickness of the annulus, which is this much. And then we sum them from n0 plus 1 to infinity. Uh, but this is, this is at the harmonic series, so this is uh, equal to adding from n0 plus 1 to infinity of 1 over j, which is infinite, which is bigger than 1. Therefore, no matter how close to the origin we start, we will be adding the tail of the series, and being divergent, that will always add up to the infinity. Um, so, claim is proved that this row is indeed and upper gradient. So what is happening here really is, is that um, we have a sequence, let's say aj, which is infinite, but then aj to power twos are finite. That's the thing. So we, we're by putting this, so inside the annulus of uh, thickness two to negative j, we have the function two to power j. These pretty much cancel out. But then we have added this clever j in the denominator, 
which when we do the integral over gamma, we deal with rho, so we deal with one over j's. But when we compute the integral, we raise it to power two, so this becomes one over j to the power two, which becomes convergent. So um, that's it. So we have shown, we have shown that u admits some L2 integrable upper gradient Um, and then u itself is in L2, of course. So u n1, 2 is less than or equal to, well, Lp of u. So L2 of u, which is 0, plus um, this L2 of the that particular upper gain to above so because this was infimum of such things. So that's the part one of the example we wanted. Part two, we want to show that actually this is um, not just finite, but zero. So u n one two is zero. And the proof here is simpler than you may anticipate it's not as involved because we've done everything above so proof in above example um, change row to so rho of z, remember what we did was, it was 2 to j over j if j belonged to aj, and infinity for, sorry, for z in aj. And it was z infinity at the origin. And then it was 0 for all z bigger than 1 but again for the for the same reason that we only look at the tail it's the tail that helps the uh, this integral become bigger than 1 actually it becomes infinity it's only the tail and near the origin that get, gets that so it wouldn't matter if we started this instead of at 1 we killed it off at say some m and then um, here only we allow j bigger than m so which means uh, in the previous example where rho was zero all outside the unit disk and then we had these two to j over j's in the inside we can start this function much later um, this integral again as i explained becomes infinity only because of the tail nearing near the origin, so it still is a, a Borel function. What happens with this change is that now integral rho 2 over r2 dl2 can be made, so let's say rho is still a Borel upper gradient of u but now this L2 integral can be made as small as possible uh, by choosing M large. Reason, summation one over J squared, which was the L2 integral starting at M goes to zero if m goes to infinity. This is basically the L2 integral, or an upper bound for the L2 integral of rho. Thus, the infimum of L2 integral is zero 
over all upper gra gradients of u. And that's the end of the story. The L2 integral of u is 0 itself. Okay. So this this finishes that the example. So we've come up with a non-zero function that is in n one two, but nevertheless its uh, norm is zero, and that explains the reason why we have to quotient out uh, with respect to that relation. This example we will see again later. This um, radial function defined separately on annuli when we talk about the modules of path families. This is basically the proof that, uh, kind of a heads up for future content, that the modules of the path family that hit one point, if we look at all the curves in the plane that pass through a single point, they have um, zero modulus. They form a negligible collection of path. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please put them down in the comments. Thank you for watching.